like to welcome all of everybody. Uh, I don't think we've got a single visitor in here. We've got a senior high noon uh, celebrity that joins us today. We'll have, we'll have to give him a little bit of airtime. Uh, Didn't we pass a rule that PIs aren't allowed here anymore? <laughs> mercy. Father, we stand as a nation on, on the brink of really disaster. And Father, we need you. We pray that our leaders would understand that on their knees they need to look up to you. Father, we pray for even the debate tonight, Lord, that you would be in charge and Father, that you would uh, somehow get the honor that you deserve. Father, today we pray that for the, the servicemen and women that we have across the world, protect them, guide them. Father, we just pray for this group too, or that we can be uh, the light that we need to be, do what we need to do, in sharing not only the reality of freedom, but also the reality of your peace and grace and mercy in our lives. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks a lot. Attention. Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So I just want to make you all aware of this. You know, if you can let people know, 
Okay, uh, well, there's a convention. You can go to James Lankford's website. My name's Ron. You can go to James Lankford's website. He and four other senators are uh, tied to write a bill to stop this. It's very true, and it is happening. And uh, it's pretty sad. You know about it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You, you, you know, just go to Langford's website, and you'll see it on there. It's very true. Uh, I don't have a computer. No, no. So. No, what? I'll, I think this yeah. is one of the trade acts. No, this no. is separate from that. Is it? Yeah, it's, yeah it's a whole different deal. And it is true. Any other? Well. Any other comments? Whew. Man. Well, he's got screws all the way out to the, when he's gone, right? Are we sure we're going to get rid of it? Yeah. Okay. I'd like to introduce um, uh, Joe Newhouse. Joe is a naval, is a naval commander, I think, currently and a candidate for Senate District 25. Joe, the, the microphone here. Great, thank you. Right, well, thank you, Don. And uh, thank you, Joe, for your service, uh, your military service. There's quite a few of Aaron's Hatchet with Aaron Jim and Robert also. Right don't rile them up now. <laughs> <laughs> you don't rile them up. That's a good thing. Right, <laughs> Well, it is an honor to be with you. I've been wanting to come by the Hynden Club for such a long time. You guys have a reputation through the entire state. And so this is quite an honor for me to be invited. Steve, thank you for helping to organize that, Patty and, and Don also. Uh, so I'm from uh, the Tulsa area and my district, District 25. And, uh, so we're even here about the Hynden Club uh, all around the state. So this is like a crossroads. Uh, so it's going to be a nice little feather in my cap to be like, hey, I want to have a chance to speak at the Hynden Club. So thank you for what you're doing. And, it also feels pretty cool to be surrounded by all these guns uh, all around us in the <laughs> store. I love this. So, it feels super safe. It feels like back in the military base giving a speech. You know? So uh, this is a great environment also. Uh, well, my name is Joe Newhouse, and I'm the Republican nominee for State Senate District 25. And that is includes all of Bixby, which is South Tulsa area. So it's all Bixby, parts of Broken Arrow and James. Lots of South Tulsa, and this was a very heated contest that we've gone through. Uh, this is a, a, this is an open seat because the guy that I'm replaced, hopefully, hopefully replaced, is uh, Senator Mike Basie is term limited. Uh, thank God for term limits, just in the sense that it's good that we that no one, no one gets you know too vested in, in government. That's not that was never the role, um, and I think we need to keep keep politicians you know being cycled in and out. You know, I think that's a good thing. Uh, so. Uh, some, some crazy election races, but by the grace of God, we've we been through now, and we're now going toward the general election on November the 8th. And my Democratic opponent, his big thing is he wants to fund government through the full-scale legalization of marijuana. And he's trying to say this is what Oklahomans want and need. I say it absolutely not. Uh, he wants to raise the state income tax. He said that 8% is a reasonable rate to tax people. He wants to raise minimum wages. Uh, this is only going to hurt employers also. Basically, there's a tax. He likes the tax. And so, uh, as a military guy myself, certainly not getting complacent about any of this. And it's almost shocking not to hear these accounts, but the fact that some people take this seriously. Uh, on this side. So we've got to stay uh, vigilant, always got to stay on the guard to, co to continue to advance our conservative principles. Well, I just wanted to introduce myself a little bit uh, and then share a few platform ideas and really what I want to do is do, do some Q&A with you. And that, more like a Q&A and see the questions and answers and your concerns and your ideas. Uh, I'm a young guy, I'm here to learn from you. And so uh, my, my goal in life is really to open up more of these than, than this, this, uh, this mouth right here. But just a little bit about myself. I grew up in Oklahoma. I'm a native here, uh, grew up in Broken Arrow, and uh, went to Broken Arrow Public Schools, K through 12. My senior year in high school, I spent it as an exchange student over in Germany. I uh, lived on a German farm for a year. Got a chance to actually, I, I had more in common with the German farmer than I did you know, living in some of the cities in America. In some kind of way. So, I did, yeah. Uh, and. Uh, so you have a chance to see life from a different perspective and appreciate America from a different perspective. 
And this is one of the, I'll just take a quick tangent. I had a class in Germany about American history. Mm -hmm. And at first, I said, oh, and, and, and in Germany, they're saying, oh, okay, so next week we're going to start a class in American history. I thought to myself, oh, great, you're kidding me. I came all the way to Germany, learn about American history. <laughs> but it was the most interesting class I ever had because I got to see how others view our history. It really made me stop and take a critical analysis of things. I began to make myself uh, just, just think long and hard about how we've grown up, uh, like our country. And here's one of the things that they so highly espoused about us was our rugged individualism. They just kept talking about that. My ancestors were pioneers uh, going through the Midwest. Uh, we go back generations. And, but just hearing their accounts from the Germans, like, wow, these Americans had such courage to go out there and start this new life. And it was, it was really just amazing to hear that. And there's some things they, of course, they didn't like about our history, but that's just part of life. You know, you just, you, you just keep moving on. But, uh, but anyways, it helped me see America from a new perspective, which I really liked. Um, after that year, I went to uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, hopefully it's the last time I had to live in Washington, D.C. Uh, I went there to study uh, international economics at Georgetown University. But really, the, the question was, well, should I go <coughs> be some guy chasing Wall Street or do what's really the right thing to do to serve my country? So uh, without flinching, I, I passed up a, a job offer that was very nice and I said take, intentionally took the pay cut to join the military. I, I was um, I joined the Navy, I became a Navy jet pilot uh, from there. Navy also. Oh, Air Force, okay. Jimmy back there. Oh, that's this one. Okay, okay, there we go. Okay, so you're pointing at it. Which was, where it's going. All right, go Navy, Dad. All right, nice. Yeah, so I had a chance to serve my country in the Navy, fought in the Iraq War, flying combat missions over Fallujah. In Baghdad, really was were there just to provide aerial coverage to marine convoys uh, down below. Um, uh, from there, uh, I later taught at uh, Navy Flight School in Pensacola, Florida, as a uh, as a fighter pilot instructor. And had a great time. Uh, after that point, uh, my wife and I we decided to move. Uh, she was we had three kids, and she was pregnant with number four. And uh, to everyone's uh, saying no to me, we actually left active duty and the economy of 2010, we said, we felt the Lord was calling us to move on. I love the military, but I feel that there was something else we want us to do. So, you know, everyone's saying, what are you doing? You're crazy. You're getting out in this horrible economy. But you know, you always follow God. I mean, it's just, I don't pretend to get every answer right, right now, but I think if you try to follow Him, you'll, you'll do okay. I mean, we got a chance to move back to Oklahoma. I started my own business there, and along the way, I got a chance to meet a gentleman uh, whose name was Jim Bridenstine. He, uh, when we met, um, we met outside, of, he and I were both Navy pilots, we met outside of the Navy, and uh, he, at the time he said, hey, you know, I think I'll run for Congress, and um, helped him out with the campaign, and later on I worked for him part-time as a field representative, and let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's just amazing the people that the Lord will bring into your lives, uh, just to be able to be mentored by somebody, so I've had a chance to work alongside and for somebody that I tremendously respects, and that is Jim Bridenstine. And I can tell you from all the times I've you know, you know, driven around or been with him at different events, uh, in his office, talking talk with him one-on-one, -on -one, he is the same person behind the scenes as he is up on stage. You know? So I know he's spoken at the Heineken Club before, too. And uh, he's, he's somebody who stands up for principle. And so I've learned a lot from him. And in fact, a lot of things that I'm trying to do for the state senate is you know, examples I've learned from, from him, from the federal side. And uh, I'll, I'll say a few things that I've learned. Um, uh, well, maybe not just mention, I mean, just doing the right thing every time is much, you know, if you just try to do the right thing, uh, and the rest stands for principle, you're going to be okay. You're going to take some darts, but at the end of the day, you're doing the, 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 the good work, right? Uh, but along the path of, with him, uh, I go to different events, and I would go to events kind of like this, and I'd hear the questions being asked of him. I thought to myself, how would I answer that if I was being asked this question? So I started doing was, if I didn't know the answer, then I'd go study it. I'd go research it. In fact, I read it, once read a, a, a 1,000 page book about the gold standard, because uh, he'd ask that question. I thought, you know what, I studied economics, and I kind of forgot that answer. Let me go ahead and read and remember this again. Uh, so anyways, before launching this campaign for state senate, I took about a year out of my life just to study different works. Everything from the Founding Fathers, uh, psychology, economics, I read the entire Quran, 
just trying to get a different viewpoint just to all sorts of things. And let me tell you, Don, you just shake your head. It's, uh, it's true with... It's terrible reading. I'll, I'll, t I'll touch on it just really quickly. You know, Western liberal journalists have it completely wrong. They, they try to paint this picture that is not accurate. And I can show you passages in there that I've, I've, I've read. It's not taking these out of context. I mean, there's passages in there that should give alarm for Western civilization. It's just it's that, it's that, it's that simple. You know, but anyways, uh, one of the other works I read was the Oklahoma State Constitution. And as you know, That's this is an entire version. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> So it's it really self abuse. It's self abuse, right? And so uh, I'd encourage you, if you have other state candidates that come through here, just say, "Hey, did you read the Constitution yet?" Uh, and check out their answer because it, really to read it, it is a very lengthy process, overly lengthy. In fact, that's one of the things I want to talk with you here in just a short amount of time. Uh, but, but anyways, I just want to let you know I'm taking this very seriously. Um, our, our country is headed in the wrong direction. I consider myself a Christian and a conservative who happens to find myself in the Republican Party right now. This country is on the wrong path. Our state's on the wrong, wrong, the wrong direction. I, mean, I can show you. I can show you not just from. Um, well, I can show you from like most economic principles and, and, and policies how we are on an unsustainable path right now. And so the question isn't when. Well, the question isn't if you know, catastrophe could happen, but more like when, unless we change our trajectory. And then we can go on a big whiteboard and kind of write it all out for you how this is kind of panning out. And basically what the people do is they're just kind of kicking the can down the road each time. And we can only do it for so long. There's certain variables where we're able to keep doing that. But eventually, once those variables change, then that shifts the whole equation. I don't want to go in that direction to say right now. But uh, all I have to say is I have deep concern uh, for our country. I've got four kids. This is, this is why I'm doing this. I refuse to sit on the sidelines. I refuse, refuse to be somebody who fought in a war uh, protecting our interests, only to come back and say, and this, let it slip away. I, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do it for my kids. I want them to have a better future than what I had. I think I had a good, good upbringing. Well, uh, I, I have a few things to share with you. Um, and then from there, please, you know, questions, answers, concerns, anything like that. I just want to open the floor up. But uh, and as an economist, uh, uh, Actually, this morning, before coming here, I met with members of the Senate Finance uh, Committee staff getting an update on what's happening at the Capitol uh, right now from the uh, finance perspective. One of my hopes is to, to join the Finance Committee. So the senator that I would, would be replacing, Senator Mike Nazy, is the chairman of the Finance Committee. And myself having a finance background, uh, what I'd like to do is continue working this critical analysis of what Oklahoma has come to be just make this excessive incentive program. Did you know that to the tune of about $2 billion a year is our total business tax incentive program? That includes exemptions, tax credits, rebates, you name it. So we start that, looking at this $2 billion worth, you can ask yourself, well, is all this worthwhile? See the, the, the thumbs down, that's right. So um, if you start looking at how much that is pure waste, it's like, wait a second, I heard we have this budget deficit, right? I heard we're, we're lacking funding and core services. <coughs> wait, I know where the money is. Let's go take a look over here. Let's go take a look at the wind energy uh, industry, which in 2010 gave about $100,000 in political donations to legislators. And then to the tune of $80 million uh, just this, this past year through tax credits that do not have taxpayers are funding into this. But it creates jobs, right? These, these, these companies are owned by people out of state, out of country. They don't even employ long-term Oklahoma jobs. It's, there's a lot of jobs for the construction, the initial setup, but the maintenance of the ongoing efforts hurts about hardly anything. And so you and I are subsidizing this industry for what? So we can be number four in the country, we have, we have some bragging rights about this. Uh, but there's other things that I think that the there's just so much rampant abuse in our, our finance system in Oklahoma. I have a, a laundry list of areas I wanted to say, cut, 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 reform, you know, modify this over here. Look at the quality jobs program. Uh, last year, about approximately ninety million dollars, right? Four million of that ninety million dollars went to the Oklahoma City Thunder basketball team. Yeah. Yay, <laughs> Aren't you glad that the taxpayer is subsidizing? Well, they wouldn't be able to afford their house if we did. <laughs> it's so sad, isn't it? 
And so you start looking at this, uh, you hear people complaining about lacks of like a funding in certain areas. I'm like, well, look, look at all this wasteful money we've got over here. You don't need to start talking about tax increases until you can do better with what you've got right now. And so uh, I think it's with, with the, there's an ongoing effort right now with the Oklahoma Incentive Evaluation Commission, which is analyzing $475 million, about half a billion dollars worth of tax credits. I think it's a good first step. It needs to continue. So when I get elected as state senator, I want to jump into that finance committee and just start saying, look, all right, let's, let's, let's take a look at this. Uh, you get, you got to start proving this stuff. You can't just, just say these, these empty platitudes of, well, it's creating jobs. Help you, go ahead and prove it. There's ways you can prove things. And unfortunately, these past several years, they have not been proving it. Uh, they have been proving that they can just take our money and, and waste it. Right? So that's my, my first point right there. Uh, second point, of course, there's a lot of notoriety with uh, education in Oklahoma. And I'll say I am completely against state question 779, the name of board sales tax increase. This is a horrible idea. I've been against this since day one when it first came out. Good. I'm glad. I'm adamantly opposed to it. And as many of you know, make us the highest sales taxed state in the country. We're going to be more than Connecticut and New York. Give me a break. You know, we're, we're Oklahoma. You know, that's not the number one thing that we want. It's going to drive more people to buy online purchases where they can, they're supposed to be a use tax, but 96% of them do not. So you can actually see less sales taxes collected by driving people to online shopping where they can get free shipping and not pay any tax, essentially. And what's this going to do to local retail businesses? Like this one here, this H&H. This, uh, &H. I've talked to gun store owners all across my district, and here's the thing, like in economic downturns, they get hit hard because... A lot of uh, weapons purchases are used with discretionary money, right? So if you have a little extra money left over, uh, you, can, you can buy those, those types of purchases. Well, people, uh, oftentimes those types of goods can be purchased online. And if you start charging higher and higher sales tax, companies like, like businesses like this will get hurt. Uh, people will shop online, not, not pay those taxes. So this tax will additionally hurt seniors on a fixed income. It's an aggressive tax. So it's going to hurt uh, struggling families. So of a sudden, a single mom with, with three kids, she's now having to pay more proportionally you know, to fund this, this new tax incentive. Uh, and then also, you, you hamstring cities. So city governments, which in Oklahoma, they have their hands tied that their, their, the way they raise revenue is sales tax. So if you raise the sales tax, now you're making it harder for them to collect their any additional tax that, that they might need, or really jeopardizing what they might collect. So, look, I like good police services. I like good fire services. Those are core government functions. I don't want to jeopardize those. Especially when you consider like, where that money for 779 is actually going to go. Yes, yeah, some of it will go to teacher pay raises. <clears throat> but also some of it will go to higher education and other, uh, other areas, which, you know, some certain institutions in Oklahoma with higher education have these huge endowment funds. You know, uh, I just don't see that as the, the critical need right now. And so, anyways, I'm completely against 779. Well, people ask, well, what are your ideas for education then? Well, as far as funding wise goes, well, number one, I'm going to go going back to the tax incentives. You know, we can take a look at that. There's hundreds of millions of dollars sitting on the table in waste. We can transfer that to core services, such as education. And also, school district uh, administration consolidation. If you go to the Oklahoma State Department of Education website, you'll see 556 school districts mentioned for 692,000 students. That's one district for 1,200 kids. National average, one district for 2,800 kids. Florida does it even better. One district for 35,000 kids. Seven districts or something like that? Five or seven? Right. So with modern day technology or advances, we should be able to easily streamline many of these administrative functions. Why are we still resting on this old system, this antiquated system from you know, decades and decades ago? Always done it that way. <laughs> <laughs> We've always done it that way. And that's, that's probably one of the biggest problems that I think that we face in Oklahoma is the good old boy club. You know, the good old boy tax system. It's uh, we can take you can change somebody else's good stuff, but don't change mine. And we have too much of that going on. I was very disheartened on this past legislative cycle when people have proposed, hey, let's, let's take a look at consolidating some of the school districts. It wasn't even considered. It wasn't even brought to the floor, it wasn't brought even to, I think it made even committee. Here at a time when we're facing a $1.3 billion budget deficit, I think all options should be on the table, quite frankly, take a look at, right? So 
So I think that we've got, before we just start dumping money in, into education, let's take a look about how we can make that much more efficient. We pay our administrators in Oklahoma way too much money. We're so top heavy. I do want to get teachers a higher salary, a pay raise for our teachers. But the thing is, we've got to get that money away from administration, push that, thing, get that seat down to where, 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 where it really needs to go. Into the classroom. Into the classroom. Well, the teachers need more money because they're having to go out and buy pencils and paper and crayolas and supplies. My, my grandson and granddaughter, they're always spending, you know, like, you know, it's a Walmart pick up this, this, and that one. You don't have it? Well, we got it at home, but we don't have it at school. Right. Church of Mustang just donated to the Mustang School District $500,000, correction, $50,000 to pay for paper for the school year. Wow. Yeah. $50,000. Right. It is sad we're having to go to these, these types of lengths to do that. I mean, I'm glad that the church is under church are helping to donate. But at the same time, it's kind of like, look, we can definitely manage money much better than this to not have to put us into that kind of extreme position to begin with. Well, how much money does our state generate from the lottery on a daily or weekly or monthly basis? If whenever they sold that to the Oklahomans, they were supposed to help pay for all of this stuff that we're talking about right now. It, and I think 77 now would be another gimmick to happen. So we've got the lottery, casino, liquor by the drink. It's like you name it, they, they test things to school funding yeah. because it's for the kids to make something pass. Right? Even Governor Henry mentioned, he had admitted that he had oversold the lottery as a fix-all for education. Of course, this is all after the fact. We still have a lottery. Sure. You know. uh, percentage of the lottery, percentage of uh, lottery tax, percentage of uh, cigarette sales tax goes to teachers' retirement fund. Uh, I didn't catch it. What was it? A portion of the uh, lottery funds. Lottery funds and portion of the sales tax on cigarettes go right into the teachers' retirement. Which is another issue here too, like the teacher's retirement fund. Of course, that was pilfered years ago, largely by the Democratic Party, by the way. Use it to pay for things. Oh, Social Security. Oh yeah, you saw these, these pots of money go in there, and take money out from there. But look, if you're going to promise something, you got to maintain your promises. So make promises to our, our teachers, our firefighters, police officers, like their retirement systems. Let this fund it and then, and then leave it alone. Uh, it should not be used as you know these uh, accessible wallets, so to speak. I know that was was the clip you're talking about from the lottery part portion, uh, but we have this I think this, this tendency sometimes to uh, oh, we have sweet different. Well, I've seen her pay Paul. Yeah, that's the way to put it right there. Well, the third thing I wanted to mention, and again before we go into Q and A, is. Uh, if you look at, go back to the Oklahoma State Constitution, if you look at our history of how we got our Constitution, it's actually pretty sad and interesting sad at the same time. Uh, so in 1906, the Enabling Act passed by Congress authorized Oklahoma to go ahead and begin making its you know, preparations for a Constitution. Unfortunately, the Republicans at that time had been uh, kind of married up with the uh, railroad industry, which by that time had received a lot of negative press because people were really trying to push them against the monopolies, which is a good thing. To push against that, but it left such a bad taste in the in the people's mouths here in Oklahoma that they said, "Get rid of the Republicans, uh, let's embrace the at the time the socialists and progressives," and they're the ones who came in to write our constitution. So if you look at our constitution, it's true; it was written by progressives, socialists. In fact, it was being heralded at the time as, "Wow, everyone, look at Oklahoma! Let's see what they're going to do because this is a brand new state, a brand new constitution." <clears throat> Of course, what has it left us with? So many you know, institutions, plans, and programs in our Constitution that we've had to maintain all these years. And so I hear all the time, like, well, people are trying to beat up on Republicans or conservatives. Like, well, look, it's, look at this Constitution. Look at this setup. It's be like as if you and I were to build a race car together in a garage and you pull off this, this chassis. It's a, it's a truck, a truck chassis. You're trying to build a race car on that. That's not going to happen, right? You're going to build a race car on a truck chassis. We are trying to now have a conservative government built upon a, a socialist chassis, is essentially what that happens with the state constitution. If you start looking at some of the things that get endeared in there and protected, it's amazing. There's so many good old boy institutions that are protected by our constitution. And uh, I mean, we can talk about the, uh, 
Even our, uh, uh, our Supreme Court Justice holdovers, you know, which eight of, eight of the nine have been, been nominated there by, by Democratic governors. And uh, we start looking at us trying to change things from a conservative perspective. You have this basically a socialist constitution and a, essentially a socialist type of uh, judicial uh, uh, selection process. It's kind of strong words. I can, I can, I can, I can just file that, that, that right there too. But so going back to myself as a state senator, one of the things I want to do, and this is going to take a long time, is we need to revisit our state constitution. Texas rewrote their constitution in the early 1970s. Let's say we can't do the same thing in Oklahoma. And instead of making these band-aid fixes constantly, why can't we, as a collective conservative state, say, look, you know, we have these conservative principles and thoughts. We want a, a, a reformed constitution that aligns much more with how we actually believe. And, and that stops the stops the uh, tying our hands behind our backs. It's gonna be a long process, and I'm working with Charlie Meadows uh, on this one. See what we can get to get going. You know, it's gonna take some time, uh, a lot of your your support. So I know I'm a, I'm a Tulsa guy, but well, I'm, we'll see as a guy again. I hope you do see me again. I hope I, I hope I can work with you. Uh, this is a state issue, you know. So I, I hope to to be around the state and and also work with other like-minded uh, leaders. That you guys have in mind and say, hey, you know that new house guy, you should go meet him. You guys should team up and see what we can do to help advance conservatism in, in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. well, that's a lot of talking on my part. Uh, I'd certainly love any kind of questions or concerns, sir, please. Isn't, uh, isn't there something in the Constitution that requires a convention every 20 years? I don't recall yes. having seen that. I've heard, heard, that, heard that's, that's in there. Um, such a long document, I forget everything that's, that's written in there. You can't remember all of it? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. But it's sad when uh, we actually have the longest constitution in the country. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, a constitution should be there just to preserve the trying individual rights. Not talk about the border regions, not talk about uh, you know mining rights and those types of things that really just enshrine and build with love. It should be there to just simply state the core functions of the government, okay, protect life, liberty, and property. Question. I have uh, I have two questions. The corporation takeover seven seven seven, and how much has the chamber uh, funded your opposition? Right. Okay. Uh, so with uh, state question seven seven seven. My understanding is that they're trying to build this as, oh, let's help protect these small farming operations. That's how the marketing gets pushed out there, when in fact, uh, a lot of the big commercial agricultural enterprises are trying to come in to you know, preserve those, those types of rights, so to speak. Here's what's going to happen that, that does go through, is I think it ties the hands of individual citizens and their representation to actually make future legislation uh, along the lines of what's needed for agriculture. Don't get me wrong, I can't stand the EPA. I think they uh, overset their bounds constantly. So I can see the needs for, for, for us in Oklahoma to want to push back against that. But uh, I think the, what 777 is going to enshrine uh, could actually end up tying our hands more than, than, than they want to right there. Now, as far as the uh, chamber backing the opposition, uh, so they've, they've uh, They've been fiercely opposed to me since day one, uh, and uh, uh, with each step of my race, I went through a primary, then a runoff, and then I'm going to the general. Uh, in, each, in the primary, they didn't blow money for our opponents in the runoff. They also um, endorsed and highly supported my opponents in their, in their, the word in the street was, they said that anybody with a new house. And so, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it's a request. Maybe that's a good thing, right? So, when you get elected, I'm trying to find people that are going to. Uh, my, my name is Paul. When you, I'm trying to find people that will initiate a bill to allow the auditor, on his own volition, to audit anything that receives public money, because you can't audit a school unless they request it. So I met with Gary Jones just a few weeks ago in his office. I got a chance to talk with him a little bit. And but, uh, but you're right, Paul. The thing is, to have an auditor, we need to, to allow that 
allow him or her in their office to be, go, to be independent and go uh, pursue any agency or institution that they, that they like. So myself from a military background, <coughs> be uh, like an, an inspector, like an IG report, right? So an IG report, like an IG inspector, um, they can come in anytime, no advance warning or anything for any reason. If you're prompted, unprompted, they can come in and guess what? You're going to answer every single question that they ask you. And they have no, uh, no limitations. Uh, they're not, they don't have any public strings telling them what to do. They would make them completely independent. And so if we're going to have a state auditor, let's not just have one in name only. Let's have one that has some, some teeth behind it. And it, it, not that we're just trying to sick them on people. The thing is sometimes an auditor can even it can be very helpful also when you, you can help to uh, identify certain inefficiencies and things that aren't being accurately reported. And here's one of the things I like about uh, what Gary Jones did here recently is that the uh, very many, like a, a huge uh, percentage of the counties in Oklahoma, their property assessors have not been accurately um, dialing property appropriately. And so that has caused the state to lose out on $192 million worth uh, right there. Don't get me wrong, I'm not for raising taxes, but I'm about enforcing the fair you know, tax policies for everybody. You know, the same rules can apply to one county to, to the other. Uh, so I appreciate his office's uh, efforts. I think he's been very aggressive um, in identifying those certain areas. But you're right, though. He needs to have the abilities to go around to different areas uh, without any kind of undue supervision and, and execute his job. My name is Karen, and I'm wondering how you feel about uh, state sovereignty. Do we, are we an individual state that joined the union? Or are you looking at it as the federal government was first? And well, the federal government wasn't first. <clears throat> it's actually the state that was first. So, you know, we've been the, the, the 10th Amendment. And here's the a, here's a thing. If you look at the supremacy clause uh, in the U.S. Constitution, a lot of people think that just because the federal government says something, oh, I guess we have to acquiesce to whatever they say. That's not true. And so the U.S. Constitution uh, eliminates powers in certain cases to the federal government to allow them to do their proper functions. For all other areas, that's allowed to delegate to the states, right? So this, the Constitution is actually uh, silent on crime, health care, education, retirement, all, <clears throat> all those different areas. But here's the thing, so the federal government keeps trying to intrude on those areas constantly. And this president has proven time again that he will get, uh, bypass the Constitution and basically just try to uh, tell the states what to do, right? So he's constantly doing that. I think as a state senator, what I want to do is say, look, I believe in federalism. There's the you know, federal government, the state level, the state level, uh, the local governments. We all have our defined responsibilities. And I'm very clear in that. And actually, if you go to my website, you can check out one of the papers I wrote on uh, protecting the Second Amendment from overreach, and uh, you'll see in there I uh, talk about state sovereignty and about protecting our state's rights. Um, you hit on something I forgot. My name is Jerome, and I got a question, uh, kind of a two-part question. Uh, in analyzing the nation's state or the state of the union, what do you believe is the prime culprit? And, uh, and I'm going to kind of help you with it. It's probably a couple of words, but what do you believe is the prime culprit that has caused the national economy to just be sinking down? And after you get the answer, I've got another part, two second part of that. Okay. Well, Jerome, so there's many, many factors <clears throat> that that's, that's affecting that. One is immigration. So if you have uh, large-scale illegal immigration with unskilled labor, what that does is that will drive down labor rates, right? So let's say you're uh, a worker in Oklahoma and you work with your hands or you're, you're, you're a blue collar, uh, just every hard worker, right? Your labor rates are being driven down because of encroaching immigration that, that comes in, right? Because you're now competing against other immigrants who might take a, a lower wage to do the same type of work. What that does over time is that can also sink the uh, 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 the, the total standard of living around the country as well. So if you're talking about, you know, let's say, wages and the economy being, being suppressed, uh, that's one of the factors that's, that's happening. Uh, another factor, probably one of the bigger ones, is our Federal Reserve System. 
And so what we do is, uh, with this president, he has averaged about every year about 800 uh, 800 billion to a trillion dollars a year in budget deficits, right? Now, if you ask yourself, well, how's this, how's this getting paid? Because eventually it has to get paid somehow. And people stop to you know, wonder about that. But basically, <clears throat> the Treasury is selling bonds to the Federal Reserve, right? So the Federal Reserve pr produces more money, gives it to the Treasury, and they pay out these entitlement programs. Essentially, what you're doing is you're inflating the, the money supply. So. When you have this types, these types of monetary inflation, uh, you're also driving down wages and real growth in, in these cases. I mean, there's, uh, those are two examples I can give. What, what was your, uh, what were your, your thoughts to you on, on some of this question? Uh, I, I was kind of searching or, or reeking for the fact is the increase in liberalism or progressivism, which is also an increase in socialism in, in the nation state. Right. But I enjoyed your answer. Part two, do you think that NAFTA North American Free Trade Act has had anything to do with the meltdown of America's economy and the moving of uh, factories overseas. Oh, absolutely. Now, that, that TPP is on the pike. And how do you feel like that will affect the nation state and this state here? Sure. It will so, pass. Right. So I studied, I studied international economics in, in college. And uh, I've been around the world you know, quite a bit uh, and analyzed different economies and how, how things are being affected. Here's what happens to America time and again. <clears throat> all the regions around the world in different countries, they all want to enter into different uh, trading agreements with America because we're the world's largest economy. But for some odd reason, whoever is orchestrating these trade agreements for ourselves, they do a horrible job. And so when they when they go into these trade agreements, you'll always find that we find ourselves on the defensive. We're always making these concessions. We're not making them have to live a make this more of a bilateral, like, like an actual free trade. The, the term free trade is actually kind of a misnomer because you think free trade, oh, we could, we, we're both going to respect each other, work together, that's not the case. And so you have different countries taking advantage of the trade agreements. So I think it's NAFTA, for example, has been a net loss for America. We have several factories and a lot of our manufacturing base that has moved down into Mexico as a fact. So my question, uh, simply thought, is do you think that NAFTA should be repealed? Uh, as far as uh, re repealing NAFTA, uh, I'd have to look into it a little bit, a little bit closer. I'd certainly modify it, uh, yeah, that's, that's for sure. Uh, I don't think it's had the intended effects that we were, were hoping for. Uh, there are some people who postulate that one of the reasons for NAFTA is they're trying to make North, North, North America more of a, like a regional trading bloc. Um, and if you can look into that further, you can see that um, there's a big, a big movement around the world to try to get big, large regional tra trading blocks together, uh, what that could do for us, I think is a bad thing, to be, because eventually that could lead towards a one world type of government. And what we want to do is maintain our voice more at the local level. So I'm always cautious about ceding too much power to some of these, these trading blocks, especially again when they are a little lopsided against us, I mean, not sure not in our favor. So you, you would think that NAFTA and TPP would probably and that result would kill America's sovereignty to some great degree. Do you agree to that? I, I, I think that it affects uh, the, the sovereignty right, right there. And it's, especially if you start looking at the language that's written in some of these trade agreements. Uh, because there are certain things, there are certain triggers that, you know, we, can, we can't really do anything until a certain trigger is hit, you know. And so to maintain your sovereignty means that you can retaliate in, in times where you feel that you're being uh, taken advantage of or even... I'll uh, use, use a different example. Um, it's well known that both China and Russia are engaging in very aggressive uh, cyber warfare against the United States, right? So if we do things like TP, like the TPT, uh, TPT and then uh, uh, the different, different types of, types of uh, trade agreements, you start looking at different ways that uh, it's like, wait, wait, they're taking advantage of us, they're actually undermining us at the same time, but because of the diplomatic language that's written in there, Sometimes we have our hands kind of on our back about how we can actually retaliate to, to these countries. Thank you, sir. Who do you think is going to win the debate tonight? <laughs> <laughs> what was the question? I didn't hear it. What did you say? Who's going to win the debate tonight? Oh. Well, I'll be, I'll be surprised if, if 
uh, Hillary Clinton can even show up. <laughs> right there, I think a Trump editor already has an advantage. But I'm, a, I'm, I'm thinking Trump's going to take this one pretty, pretty rarely. I've got a question. When is our economy going to collapse? Well, there's many things you can be looking on the lookout for that would portend a very much a crisis situation. One of the leading factors, Don, you can be looking for is interest rates. So right now, we still have interest rates at a very like an all-time historic low, and essentially, uh, the Fed is basically about, about zero. So they're, that's what they're charging as you see interest rates start rising, there's different factors that go into play. What you'll see is that our national payments then will have to increase as well. So if right now, for example, we spend, I think it's like 10, 12 percent of our, our, our national budget is just servicing the debt. And we have these very low interest rates. Think about interest rates doubling, which is not that hard to imagine, not that far off. Well, then all of a sudden, we're now spending, say, 20 percent 25% of our national budget just to service the debt. That's not knocking it down. Then what do you cut? That's, that's the big question. So do you cut into entitlements? Are you going to anger senior, senior citizens who are at Social Security, you know, Medicare, you know, Medicaid, those types of entitlement programs? Do you cut defense? You know, that's uh, half a trillion dollars a year right there. So we're going to go from the world's best you know, military in the world. We're already there. Yeah, so the thing is, we're already at the point where we're not even we're not even at the point where we're cutting into our debt at all. It's just mounting. When I say we're kicking the can, we're able to kick the can because interest rates are so low. Right? But eventually that's not gonna, always gonna be the case. One of the things also helping us get down the road is that we're still the world's reserve currency. So when 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 countries in the world want to make a transaction, they don't want to deal with the Indonesian Monetary unit. They're only doing dollars. So that, that means that we have that there's a higher demand for our dollars. It makes our dollars more worth more, which is a good thing. But eventually, if people start losing confidence in the American dollar around the world, and China's already trying to do this, Russia's already trying to do this, is then uh, all of a sudden we'll have to raise interest rates just to uh, attract the same type of capital that we've been, been, been so accustomed to. So the world demand for the dollar is helping us right now, tread water, so to speak. And that will not always be the case. You, know, you already have, again, um, the, the euro is being flirted with to be become the world's reserve currency. China's pushing hard to knock off the dollar. And so you can see how the dominoes can quickly, can, can, can quickly get out of control, is, is how that works out. And so you have the Federal Reserve, which has a very limited capacity right now to increase and increase more types of uh, you know, dollar printouts. You can only do that for so long until you get rampant inflation in itself. And so, uh, maybe your, your question of when, uh, I can't give a when, but I can give you those those variables to be looking at right there. And so, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a ticking time bomb is what it is. Aren't those symptoms of a collapse? Um, <laughs> those would be precursors. <laughs> right. So, you got to ask yourself if there's a situation where how it does collapse uh, in that regard. And you can just take a look at this. So, uh, it look, uh, looked like a few years ago in Greece, this little country, Greece, was going through all those troubles. Remember all the ripples in the world economy that created? Little Greece. And I've been there. It's not, not really that you know, sophisticated or industrialized country. But just that little country caused such a huge disruption in international markets. Imagine if America has something even remotely similar, where America can't pay its debts and people are not buying bonds, um, and you know, the Federal Reserve is trying to pump out so much money and it's becoming worthless. Um, if you have something like that, you're going to have an entire global meltdown of America where to go down. And so uh, we've got to lean heavily on our U.S. Congress to do the right thing, and that is they have got to balance the budget. It just cannot sustain itself like this. And here they were, I think it was a year or two ago, when they were patting themselves on the back for only having a $600 billion a budget deficit. They're like, look at us, we made this great progress. It was a trillion dollars annually since Obama was in there. Now it's only 600 billion. Okay, yes. Well, that's, uh... I just 
one question with your military experience. What has our country done, and our leaders, to assure that if we an uh, EMP attack occurs, what are they doing to harden our electrical grid and to do anything to, to protect the American people from something like that? Because that'll be a catastrophe like we've never seen before. That's it. So <clears throat> the easy answer right there is nothing. Is nothing. Okay. <clears throat> Obama is not going to do anything about that. And so you know, years ago, an EMP bomb was seen more in like movies like you know, TV shows like Twenty Four. You know, like sci-fi kinds of movies. It's actually it's a realistic. Um, well, you can't build a Faraday cage to enclose your house or your car. Right. And and I'm not going to go out and buy a, a, an old car that's got carburetors instead of fuel injection and no computer. But right. That's what you need. Yeah. I'm just think of how many people these see. days, you know, can't rely on themselves. They rely so much on technology. And you know, just the internet or the electronics. <clears throat> to you have an EMP go off, you're gonna cause this massive chaos around our, our communities. I wake up in the middle of the night that. Yeah. It's number two compared to me running out of handle and a UV <laughs> when I was overseas. Yeah. <laughs> I never wanted to run that. You can have a sample. That was the biggest. My wife goes, You have enough ammunition now? No. You know, my father used to say the same thing, and I told him, Hey, you know, if we go down, you're complaining about me having too much food, too much water, and too much ammo and weaponry. Yeah, you go this way and I'll go that way, and when you guys get hungry or thirsty, you know where I'm at. We'll just look at what happens if there's <coughs> an ice storm forecasted. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Make shells and our shirts are wet clean. <coughs> People freak out. It's mass panic. Yeah, that's just with the weather forecast. I understand that Texas grid is hardened yeah. and someone made a statement, I don't know how true this is, it would only take a couple million dollars to harden our electrical grid. And I can't see why we can't come up with the money to do that. Because you know, it's, you know, it's the easiest thing for any country to do to put us back in the Stone Age. Oh yeah. <clears throat> I mean, you already have like cases of of us working with Israel to take out the Iranian you know, nuclear reactors by just you know, uh, encroaching into their systems, right? The Chinese and Russians are trying to do the same thing with America. It would not be that hard, well, obviously it would not be that hard, but there's ongoing threats and assaults on a near, near daily basis to infiltrate our systems. And you know, having some kind of backup, an independent backup mechanism is a, is a great idea. As far as, I don't have an answer on the details. But just for my sense as a military guy and a father, I was like, be prepared and be ready at any time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Is there time for one, one last question, John? Okay. <clears throat> Great.